Okay, well, welcome everyone to the 2012 online conference on 21st Century Lutheran Education. My name is Dr. Bernard Bull. I am Assistant Vice President of Academics at Concordia University, Wisconsin. And my area of responsibility currently has to do with our adult continuing distance education. I also teach and um, chair or direct our master's program in educational design and technology. And uh, the topic that I've chosen to explore together with you today is, uh, is set before you here. You've probably heard some of the conversation going on, this idea of the flipped classroom, also referred in the research of the lit literature sometimes as the inverted classroom, is a, is a pretty popular topic. And if any of you haven't heard of it before, I have a video that we'll get to in a little bit that you can click on and watch at your convenience in order to kind of get a, an actual experience with it. But what I'd like to do is focus our conversation on the challenges and opportunities, the affordances, the limitations of the flipped classroom concept. And um, so with that in mind, I'm going to take you through a few slides that are just simple words or phrases to get us thinking about this topic a bit more. So the first one, I use this when I present about technology quite a bit, because sometimes the affordances and the limitations of a given technology are not so easily recognizable when you first think about it. And in addition, sometimes the conversations about educational technology in the classroom and beyond are driven more by trends and popularity and what grantors are funding or not, and less about the affordances and limitations for teaching and learning. Um, so I want to have a little bit of um, an imaginative experience or imaginative exercise with you here. And again, I've done this in presentations. I use this the same um, example or exercise for a variety of topics. But we have a, a picture of a remote control here. I want you to imagine for a moment that you show up in a large lecture hall of a college classroom or maybe a large packed middle school or high school classroom. And let's say maybe it's a math class and the teacher is doing a famous chalk talk on a new concept or a new idea. And they begin to talk and they talk rather quickly and it gets going and you are getting lost the more they progress and you're not able to keep up with them and all of a sudden in a moment of frustration you look down and you notice on your desk a magic remote control actually you don't know that it's magic yet but it's just a remote control in your moment of frustration hoping that it's a magic remote control you reach down you grab it you point it at your instructor and you press pause and all of a sudden everything in the room pauses. Bewildered, amazed, you stop for a moment, you decide to play around, you press rewind. You cer Certainly you see the instructor kind of shimmy backwards as if you were rewinding a video. You see the things disappear from the board that were just present previously as the hand kind of goes in the opposite direction of normal. You press pause again, you click fast forward, and you see that you're able to jump ahead. You notice, wow, I wonder if some of the other features work as well. You press record. Lo and behold, a little red button appears on your desk. And and everything that's being spoken is being recorded as they speak. And you realize you can go back and you can review what was shared by the instructor. Let's imagine that this goes a little bit further. You press picture in picture. Now you're in this live classroom, you have the person speaking to you, and in the bottom right hand corner you're able to watch your favorite athletic game, basketball, football, whatever else it is. Um, you experiment a, a little bit and you realize that this remote has just given you an amazing magical power over this very traditional classroom. Um, now that's obviously a fictional scenario. I don't think we're going to find that happen. Maybe this uh, example comes from having seen that that uh, movie from a number of years back called Click, where the person discovers this magical remote control that they can use to fast forward themselves through the difficult times of life. Um, but I'm going to suggest that in the digital world, with the emergence of new technologies, that some of the capabilities that I just described are actually possible. Um, and that uh, a, a technology, 
um, an innovation that doesn't even seem that innovative can actually add some some really interesting affordances to a very traditional classroom environment. Um, that you can take a recording of a classroom lecture and make it available to students. And a lecture can take on a dynamic that um, that was that we never really thought about. It seems it seems so simple when we start talking about it, but it gives an affordance that we can't imagine. That means that now it in the evening I can go back and I can re-listen to, revisit a concept that was taught by the instructor, an illustration that we worked out or a worked problem on the board, I can revisit it as I'm studying, preparing for a test or a quiz or working on an assignment, and I have this just-in-time content and illustration. I can literally review what the instructor said 10, 15, 20 times if need be. Um, and that's a simple recording of a classroom, uh, a classroom lecture. Um, I want to stop for a moment and see if you have any musings of your own as you've come to uh, recognize how what seems to be kind of a technology that's just amplifying a traditional practice like a lecture, but you've seen how it's actually added some new affordances to the learning environment. I'll pause for a moment and see if anyone has any thoughts, comments, contributions about that. Okay, maybe my example was a little too far out there. Um, whatever the case, I want to use this as a chance to invite us to consider uh, a, a new possibility, this, this concept of the inverted of the flipped classroom and what it may have to offer. Before we do that, I want to share a little bit of my own kind of uh, philosophical approach to educational media, um, educational design, educational technology. First of all, I should note that I define the word technology quite broadly. I uh, use it to refer to applied scientific knowledge and also applied human knowledge, um, especially as it informs the design of different products and experiences and environments. So, for example, I call a school a technology. I refer to a classroom itself as a technology. The desks are a technology, the pens and pencils, the whiteboard, the chalkboard, the computer, the iPad, all technologies. The letter grades, technologies. The rubrics that are used to assess particular assignments, I would call those technologies as well. Um, and so I, I do use the word uh, quite broadly so that uh, you know, I can claim that my field encompasses almost everything. <laughs> but uh, um, the Neil Postman, uh, in uh, uh, several of his books, actually brings this uh, up. I think he might have first brought it up in Amusing Ourselves to Death, a book that he published, I think it might have been in the, in the late 80s. Um, also a book called Technopoly. Neil Postman was a, a, in some ways a social critic and he wasn't afraid to point out some of the challenges and limitations and even dangers of technology in contemporary society. And um, he talked about uh, the idea that every technology is a Faustian bargain, that there are things that uh, uh, some might gain and benefit from it, but there are also losses and dangers that are afforded by every technology. And so we could pick any technology on the planet and we could use it as an example to kind of experiment with and, and to test this out. We could take, for example, the idea of, um, of a gun. You know, is a gun good or bad? Well, I, I don't know if you could. Some, I guess, might want to objectively argue that guns are good or guns are bad. Um, but, but the question that Postman would draw us to is, um, what are the affordances and limitations? Uh, what's the give and take of guns? So uh, maybe you can branch them. I know this seems way off topic, but uh, it, um, what are some of the, the benefits and the dangers um, of guns? If you want to just brainstorm, go ahead and type in the chat pod on the side. Pick too hot of a political topic for our group. It seems very quiet. Oh, there we go. Okay, so guns could be used for uh, self-defense. That might be seen as a benefit. 
We have uh, the other perspective. We put guns in the hands of people, and we're democratizing a power or a capability that could hurt other peoples without intending to. Others. Okay, very good. It could actually have economic benefit or value. Someone could collect them, they have sentimental value, or they could even use it for um, a way of uh, storing up some uh, um, uh, some financial, <laughs> you know, having a little bit of a financial storehouse and something that holds value, possibly, or even create a whole economy um, or, or a whole um, uh, type of business. Obtaining food, resources, hunting. Okay, thanks, Tim. Now, um, uh, status. Now, some. Now, what Postman would also uh, pose with a technology as well is that um, that there are winners and losers with each technology. And so, you could take the concept of a gun as well and say, well, who are the winners with guns and who are the losers with guns? And that could lead us into a really interesting conversation. Postman likes to provide all sorts of, of fun examples of technologies in his books, or he has. Uh, Postman passed away a number of years ago. Um, but he has been a big influence on me. And so whenever I look at technologies in the classroom as well, I'm continually thinking about affordances and limitations. So I'm going to introduce you to the concept of the flipped classroom if you haven't heard of it before. But it's really a simple um, concept, so it doesn't need that much of an introduction. So instead, what I hope to do is be able to jump ahead and really look at some of the benefits and limitations, give us a chance to really reflect upon the good, the bad, and the ugly of this innovation. And we'll be able to do that collectively. I won't just feed you all of the ideas. Um, I also need to disclose a little bit of my own um, perspective. I am in, involved, my, my formal training is in the field of educational design and technology in terms of my, uh, my terminal degree is in that field. But um, uh, I'm involved in it because I really see it as a sort of conspiracy in which I enjoy participating. Um, I really believe that these technologies mix things up and challenge us to reconsider and to consider the ways that we go about teaching and learning, the power structures of learning environments and, and uh, institutions. And I sort of enjoy that process of mixing things up and challenging us to think and rethink things. Um, that's part of why we're hosting a completely online conference. I mean, this isn't something that we did 10 or 15 years ago as a rule. And I like the ways in which technology can challenge us to, um, to revisit how we go about learning. Um, also, another buzzword, differentiated instruction. And I'm really curious if, you, uh, if you're willing to share a little bit. When you see this phrase, I, should, I did not create this before, but maybe on the fly I'm going to create a very quick poll. And when you see the phrase differentiated instruction, how does it make you feel? Um, mad, glad, sad, bad, or indifferent? Uh, and I'm going to open this up and allow you to choose uh, multiple answers. Let's see. All right, we'll open it up and see what happens. So how does differentiated instruction make you feel? Of course, it can't make you feel, but uh, what's the natural feeling, um, any kind of emotional response that you have to this concept of differentiated instruction. Um, if you've been in the field of education recently, you've probably heard it being talked about. If you haven't, don't worry. I'll explain it a little bit to you. OK, so we have a mixed bag here. We have some who are indifferent to it. Maybe I should be adding another. If you have suggestions for a different emotion that I should be adding, uh, that's fine. So we have four glads, three sads, one bad, and one indifferent. <laughs> Very good. So the concept of differentiated instruction, as some of you could explain as well, is um, this, this idea of, well, actually, I think I have a slide that can take us a little bit further into it, um, is uh, it, it challenges us to revisit the ways in which we think about the schooling environment where the model from the industrial age that helped shape schooling for quite some time was oftentimes a concept of mass production, at least in, uh, United, in the United States. 
where um, even the ways in which the classroom environment was structured with straight rows and bells that rang in, in schools that led people from one place to another. There was that mass production concept or model. And then um, now there are some who are purporting or promoting a concept of what they would call mass customization, is that you can have certain standard aspects to the learning experience or the product, but it also can be customized. So you can think about it as the traditional publishing um, world, and then in the contemporary world now there is the possibility for self-publishing or publishing on demand. So you can actually have, uh, you don't have to publish thousands of copies of a book in advance. They can be published as the demand determines a need for additional copies that can reduce the cost. It can meet individual needs. You also have textbook companies that allow instructors to pick and choose chapters and portions of text from different books and put them together and have their own customized book. Well, the same thing is occurring uh, in conversations about individual learners in the classroom. And the question is, is it best for us to have a single learning experience and teach the student to learn how to get the most out of that single learning experience, common assessment, common way of teaching and learning, or is it possible or a better option to create at least some form of customization for the individual needs of the learners? So maybe the customization is simply something as simple as time. So one student maybe um, could benefit from listening to what the instructor said multiple times before moving on. Where another student got it the first time, they're ready to move on and build upon that new knowledge. So it might just be one student needs more time to review than others, um, and, and that could be a con uh, uh, an approach to differentiation. Uh, so differentiation often comes in uh, different ways of students experiencing or interacting with the content that's being um, studied or learned or explored or discussed. Differentiation can take place in the types of assessments. Maybe students could be assessed um, and they would demonstrate their knowledge orally, um, tactilely, um, in written form. Uh, there, you know, there might be different differentiations depending upon the learner. Um, and uh, um, so the assessments and the actual, um, the actual content and the, the learning experiences that students are getting. All right. So, uh, this is all leading somewhere. Then I'm throwing into this mix as well this concept of digital media and culture. Now the field of educational technology, uh, there's, there's another movement that's beginning to kind of step in that's sort of in some ways overshadowing the field of educational technology in some circles. There is something called, if you check out um, uh, digital media and learning, if you do a Google search, you'll come across um, DM Central the connected learning movement, a number of movements happening out in, uh, in USC and on the west coast of the United States. We see um, also um, it, there are people in the new media field and uh, they're based at uh, like the um, MIT. There is a research lab out there that's exploring some of these, a new media consortium. And we have some people who are um, doing some really interesting work on teaching and learning. Largely people that don't have their necessarily a terminal degree in education, but they have it in communication studies or in a, a, a specific content area discipline, and they are very interested in um, education. That's, this isn't true. I don't want to um, generalize too much, but, but as I'm looking at kind of the leaders in this new movement, they're not necessarily people in, um, always in, in schools of education. And, um, and they're, they're exploring new approaches to, to teaching and learning as well, and they're grappling with the affordances and limitations and, um, uh, and things like that of, of technology. At the same time, we've had for almost a decade now a, a lot of teachers who are beginning to experiment with podcasts and vodcasts, which you can think of that as a, a, you know, a podcast with video. So iTunes University is probably one of the more popular, more famous, or just iTunes in, in general the, um, is one of the more popular examples of, of podcasts. But we have a lot of teachers who have been experimenting with it. I see in the room Dan Burke who gave a presentation. Dan, was that last year or the year before on uh, podcasts at this conference? Okay, two years ago, and then I think last year someone else 
uh, built upon your presentation. So there was a part one in 2010, and then in 2011, another person built on your ideas and, and made a uh, um, sort of an advanced topic so people can go back and view the first year, the second year. So if you guys want to check the archives out, you'll see a 2010 presentation by Dan Burke on podcasts, and then in 2011, I, I, I don't know if it was Rob Jacklin, it might have been, I can't remember, but another person who stepped in and gave um, a second advanced presentation on podcasts, and, and that content is, is very much uh, relevant today. But we have that movement happening where teachers are beginning to experiment with the ability to have uh, themselves and students record portions of what's happening in class or record uh, presentations or kind of do fictional radio shows. There are all sorts of creative endeavors and efforts that were happening. So we have all of these different trends and patterns that are coming together. And, I, and I'm arguing that what I'm trying to do here is, is build a case for sort of how the flipped classroom began to emerge. <clears throat> Um, and so now I'm taking you to the inverted or flipped classroom. And I'm going to do something here. Instead of playing a video in the room, I want to give you a little bit of, of freedom to, to do this. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally going to take about a three or four minute silent break. You're welcome to, um, uh, if you need to run to the restroom or whatever, you can do that. But I'm going to invite you to take a moment to click on the link in the presentation and watch this brief video. It's a pretty popular one, so you may have seen it. Watch this brief video. And if you have any comments or questions or thoughts about it, go ahead and type it in the chat pod. But I want to use this video as a chance to make sure that we're on the same page as we think about, you know, what do we mean by this idea of a flipped classroom. So I'm going to turn my microphone off, give you a few minutes to watch the video, and then we'll continue with the presentation. Sorry if this is interrupting your listening to the video, but I'll give you just another minute and then we'll reconvene. Again, feel free to jot some of your thoughts into the chat pod.
Please do, type some thoughts and questions. Feel free to be skeptical or positive, whatever you like, but I'd love to see some of your ideas and thoughts in the pod, as in the chat pod as we move forward. But if you took the time to watch the Flip Classroom video, um, I don't know, have any, how many of you have seen that video before? You can just type it in the chat message if you have or haven't. Type yes if you've seen it, no if you haven't. Okay, so we have a, um, a mix of, of people here. Um, if you look at, actually, if you're at YouTube and you, you go back there at some point, you'll notice that there are a wide variety of videos about the flipped classroom. And one thing that's neat about them is that many of them are sort of mini case studies, and they're written by individuals who've tried it in their classroom, and they're grappling with the benefits and limitations of it. So I encourage you to take a little bit of time to look at those. There's some wonderful examples and non-examples of the flipped classroom that you can find on YouTube as you're looking to kind of get a feel for what this would actually look like in a classroom environment. Um, as, we, as we look at this, this idea of the inverted classroom then, so the concept is, is pretty straightforward, it's pretty simple. The idea is that what people typically think of as the domain of the live classroom session, that of the instructor presenting content to the students, is being in part or in whole captured in some kind of video or audio format, and then the students are assigned, uh, the given the assignment, the homework, um, to do this work outside of class. When they come together then, the instructor is working with students on their homework. Now, this is really interesting because it, it also does get to a philosophical um, perspective in some ways of what is, the, what is the most critical, the most important role that the teacher has to offer in the digital world is the most important role of the teacher an explainer of content, selector of content, distributor of content? Um, is it one who, um, is it uh, a coach or mentor uh, helping students grapple with this, this storehouse of content that exists all around them? Is it a combination of all of the above? I don't think it has to be an either or. But um, this flipped classroom concept is really challenging us to sort of revisit the role. Now for this teacher in the video, it seems as if he's coming up with the idea that, that one of the things that he most has to contribute to the students is some real-time live feedback as they're working on the problems themselves, as opposed to presenting ideas and concepts in class, practicing, doing a few work problems with the group, sending them home to work on the problems, they get stuck and lost, and then they wait until the next day to ask questions before or after class or possibly in class. Now he's, he's flipped that whole experience around. It allows the teacher then to do differentiation. Uh, so we come back to that, that word before. So we have the digital media movement that I talked about before and this concept of differentiation um, happening where now it is reasonable for the teacher to walk around and work one-on-one -on -one with students and help them um, who are work, students working at, at different paces, at different levels, and the content that's being presented, the student can watch and, and re-watch um, however they like. Now, some of you may be asking, well, okay, well, what about the student then? Why will they come to class if they have the whole lecture recorded? Well, they come to class because that's where they get the coaching and the mentoring to actually get the work done, the things that are going to be graded and the assignments and things like that. Um, and they need that, and their grade will suffer if they don't get it. Um, secondly, someone might say, well, in the flipped classroom environment, um, the, uh, how do we know the students are going to watch the videos? Well, it, it becomes really evident if they haven't watched the videos and they haven't done the work prior to coming to class. But some teachers have had some creative ways to handle this. And it's a concept that many elementary school teachers have been doing for years. And it's a concept of tickets, entry tickets and exit tickets. So the idea is you could have them watch a video and then you could have them complete a simple online quiz that can be created with any one of a dozen hundred uh, tools nowadays uh, that demonstrates basic knowledge or comprehension of what was being taught in the video. They're not doing all the work problems or anything. But once they do that, they print off a report or if it goes to the learning management system or whatever, it, it gets sent in, like if you use Moodle or something like that. But they could literally even print out a kind of ticket 
And when they come to class, they literally have an entry ticket into your classroom. They have to demonstrate that they came to class prepared. They've watched the video. They've answered the questions to demonstrate that they've watched the video and they've done their work. Now they come in and they're ready to do their work. Um, the exit ticket, by the way, could be if you're having you're d devoting a class to more higher order thinking. Sometimes what people do is they watch the video, they come in with basic level knowledge about it. You use the classroom to get them to be able to apply it, to synthesize it, to analyze it, to do higher order Bloom's taxonomy work. And then at the end of the class, you have some kind of quick check for understanding to see if they have. Uh, developed the ability to apply, and um, and that's kind of the exit ticket where they, you know, you have some kind of measure of what they have or haven't learned. I'm going to stop and see what kind of comments we have here. Um, okay, I, uh, Lois says I think this would take older teachers a long time to come around to this, um, perhaps. And yet, you know, the thing that's interesting with this, Lois, is that it's not that different in some ways. It's really, they, they have a chance for a teacher who maybe is used to a more direct instruction format, we just have to record them. And then when they come to class, they have some freedom to offer all of those years of expertise. Um, let's see here. Uh, Emily wrote, or, um, I love the idea, but how long will it take to flip your classroom? Are there certain classes that should be flipped before others? Yeah, Emily, I certainly would not argue that this is a solution that we should apply for all classes or even entire classes necessarily. This is just one option or possibility among the dozens or hundreds or thousands that a teacher might consider as they're thinking about what might be best for students to master certain concepts or ideas. Um, so that's the right question to ask is, you know, you know, where are some aspects, are there aspects of what I'm teaching students that could benefit from a flip? Um, Lois, you know, how, um, uh, how will our pastors keep up in teaching confirmation? Interestingly, Lois, I have actually had interaction with several churches over the last year that are that have been interested in putting confirmation online, and I have argued against it. I have, uh, uh, I've challenge them that part of confirmation is building a, a really positive personal relationship with the kids as well. And so I have actually directed some of them to consider something like the flipped classroom where maybe they can grapple with the content even at home with their parents, but then they still come to confirmation class to deal with the questions and the life application parts and build those good positive relationships with uh, the church staff. Um, Tim wrote, teacher as counselor, and how would this change the physical facilities, the daily uh, timetable? And that's a, that, too, is a, is a really neat question. Um, I'd be, Lois wrote, I'd be concerned about those students who do not have a home life that allowed them to watch a video. Uh, Lois, excellent. That's actually one of the limitations that I wanted to bring up in a future slide. So we can come back to that in a minute. Um, but uh, I put that under the broad category of what we sometimes refer to as the digital divide, and that really is uh, an important topic here to explore. Uh, Tim wrote, schools need to provide an online learning platform to manage resources and activities. Certainly, um, Moodle is one that's open source and pretty inexpensive as an option for people. Um, there are some other emerging uh, possibilities as well that, that we can talk about here in a minute. Feel free to continue to jump in with comments and questions. This is good. I appreciate the fact that you're you're active and engaged in this. Okay, now from the video that you watched, you got the idea that um, the flipped classroom emerges from a teacher who's recording and creating all this content him or herself. What you're going to see happen more and more over the next one, two, three, four, five years is you're going to see. Um, you're going to see publishers, textbook publishers, and free resources emerging left and right where people are creating models for the flipped classroom. And um, Khan Academy is one that is getting mixed reviews by people. It's an individual who I think he created it originally to help some nephews, maybe, with some math or science. I can't remember what the, the story is exactly. But he started creating these little video tutorials to help them out and sent them, and there was wide interest in it. And so you can check out Khan Academy. And now he has created a plethora of videos, uh, some would argue of varying quality. 
but now people are actually pulling these in and they're using them as con they're using his lectures as sort of the mini lectures and presentations for their students and they so they're using pre-developed videos to flip their classrooms having students watch these come to class and then they do the higher order thinking more um, more uh, hands-on student activities with the wandering teacher who's coaching and mentoring and and guiding students individually and then just in the last couple of days we have Ted most known for the technology entertainment and design this world um, renowned conference with a bring in um, world renowned scholars on a wide variety from a wide variety of disciplines that give these succinct and often powerful and engaging and provocative 20 minute presentations well Ted Ed is an initiative that's um, that has the videos it has a, a bunch of videos but then they've also built lessons and they allow you to go in and you can customize the lessons and you can build little checks for understanding and quizzes it's actually a, a free resource online with pre-existing media that um, allows people to flip their classroom All right, uh, Duncan, I just turned my audio off and back on, so that might have fixed. Every so often, um, I think it's maybe because I talk quickly, but every so often that'll happen, and, uh, and uh, uh, please give me some feedback if it hasn't uh, fixed the feedback problem you were getting. So these are two examples, and there are plenty of others I, um, out there. Uh, others are using YouTube to flip their classroom or teachertube.com. If some of you have examples of pre-existing free or inexpensive video sources, um, that would be that would be great uh, to share here as well. Um, some of you might be using subscription-based video uh, services like from Discovery. Um, anyone want to share what kind of video sources you might be using? that could potentially be used as part of a flipped classroom for social studies or various science lessons. Yes, Dan, I, I visited Crean Lutheran High School not too long ago and I know that's one of the things that they shared is in order to invite the teachers to explore the use of new tools and technologies and to get the students engaged in digital um, digital learning environments they uh, have a I think it's a monthly isn't it a day once a month where they don't have face-to-face -face school but there is a lesson that's designed and students in, interact with it online so I'm not sure if they're using it for a flipped classroom um, kind of design or not that would be a possibility I suppose I've also provided for you a variety of resources. So if you watched that Flip Classroom video and you're thinking, well, how do I actually create something like that? There are some tools. I think he mentioned that he uses Camtasia, Camtasia, which is a paid tool that you can download and use on your computer to capture those same kinds of videos. It's pretty easy to use. There's a, an, a free version uh, of a similar product, and it's called Jing and that's the top link so you could check that one out as well Jing allows you to do quick captures image captures of anything on your computer screen but it also allows you to do some video capture as well um, the next one is just a pre-existing it's a blog post from uh, th th that's a blog that I frequent and um, eight crucial resources for flip classrooms they give you some ideas on other software if any of you have iPad initiatives that you have in your school uh, you can have the purchased app of GarageBand, but I know that others have been experimenting with some free apps that allow you to capture audio, video, and write on the screen and then talk over it. In fact, I think uh, Dr. Mary Hilgendorf here at our school has been doing that with student papers recently. So students submit their papers, she opens them up on her iPad, and she's able to write on top of the papers and talk um, and, and then send that whole file to the students so that they get individualized feedback on their paper with audio and her marking up the paper and they, and they kind of see it um, as it's happening. 
uh, how the flip classroom is radically transforming learning, another great resource. So I've just selected a few. And I, I'm a big fan of the infographics as a way to kind of visually summarize key concepts and ideas. So this one is from uh, about a year ago or a little less than a year ago. And if you want to check that out, please um, go ahead and try it. Any of these links you should be able to click on in on the slide and it will take you to them. I will. This is being recorded and so you can actually go back in the recording and the links remain active in the recording as well so you don't have to scurry to try to copy all these although you should be able to just kind of highlight and copy some of the, uh, maybe you can't highlight you'll have to just click on them but you have a few options on how you capture them okay so affordances and then I have a slide dedicated to limitations so let me give you guys a chance to, to share some ideas. I might share a couple as well. As well. I already have. Um, but what are some of the affordances or the benefits, the things that are made possible by this approach to teaching and learning that uses digital tools, this flipped classroom comments? Let's do a little bit of brainstorming. I'm going to make the chat pod a little bit larger and more central to our conversation. And in fact, why don't I do this? I just sort of changed my mind on the fly. What I'm going to do is create two chat pods, one for affordances, one for limitations, and we can write in both at the same time and we'll see what we come up with. So here are affordances. Go ahead and start typing in there if you see some affordances you want to write about. And then I'll get a second one. Limitations. And we can compare and contrast a little bit. Please do be sure to bring up, there was, uh, I forgot who it was, maybe it was Lois who brought up the idea of some people might not have access. You can put that in the limitations. But let's brainstorm together about some of the benefits and limitations of this model. <laughs> Not can I be a uh, student uh, maturity issues. Okay, very good. I just I did not read the line previously, so I just saw issues as the limitation until I, I read uh, upward. <laughs> Came back to what you had uh, said there. Uh, <laughs> so let's uh, let's take a look at these. Please continue to contribute. I, I'm a big fan of, of skepticism here. Um, and Britt, I remember you introduced me to the skeptical or Skeptics Inquirer years ago, so let's add a little uh, skepticism to this group as well. Let's kind of try to deconstruct this and look at some of the dangers and limitations. Uh, this is a Faustian bargain. There's both good and bad to it. Um, so what about the potential to revisit material? Um, oh, thank you, Duncan. I appreciate the feedback. Um, see if that improved things. So what about the potential to revisit material? Absolutely. So something as simple as being able to repeat uh, and, and watch something over again and review it and then to be able to use that recording at just the right time. So when I'm working on my assignment I can review it in the same way that I could review notes. Uh, by the way, this is not being talked about as much in the flipped classroom environment, but um, we often assume that this has to be all teacher directed. There is no reason that you can't actually have students flipping the classroom themselves in some ways. 
Now, a teacher may have a traditional classroom, but if a teacher allows students to record parts of what's happening, part of what's happening in class, they can actually capture that, bring it with them. I use a tool where when I take notes, I can audio record, and the audio um, syncs up with the notes, so I can find the place in the audio where, um, you know, in the lecture where I was taking that note. So there are substitutes that are kind of uh, flipping the classroom a little bit on their own, so that they have a study aid and a guide. Uh, while they're working on homework at home. I mean, they still don't have that teacher there with them while they're studying. But then they'll create study groups on their own to help each other with their homework. So regardless of what the instructor does, the students are generating these supplemental environments and resources to kind of do their own flipping. Uh, that happens, obviously, less on the elementary school level, a little more on the high school level, and even more on the um, undergraduate level, and um, in some cases, quite a bit in the graduate school level. One-to-one uh, -one access with teacher in the classroom. Students can choose a different learning sequence. Oh, the sequence is an interesting concept, Tim. That's that's really um, really neat. Uh, parents uh, joining in, so parents can can jump in. Great. Let me just skim some of the limitations that we see here. Okay, so if the teacher feels the need to ha have to build the library. Now, uh, I, I'm going to have a slide to get us to think about that one in a different way, how we can maybe turn that limitation, how we can actually uh, flip that limitation. Teachers need to be more than uh, one day ahead of their <laughs> lesson plans, yes, that, that's true. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close these out. You can continue to type on the left-hand side. Um, but I, I don't want to go too much further. We have another exciting presentation happening in about 10 minutes. But uh, I'd like to just pose a couple of concluding thoughts here. So we've been introduced or reintroduced or reconsidered some of the challenges, limitations of the flipped classrooms, possibilities for teaching and learning. Um, but the, the reality is we're busy and we have busy lives and classroom teachers don't have lots of prep periods and oftentimes they're coaching and they're being parents and husbands and wives and going to school and, and there are lots of other demands for their time. So there's no reason to necessarily reinvent the wheel all the time. And there is a wealth of pre-existing content on the web. Sometimes we may find that we want content that's distinct to our student population, however, um, and this is where I believe that we have great opportunity to leverage emerging communication technologies to help one another out. Um, we have a Lutheran education network that is international in scope, and yet we're just beginning to experiment with collaborating with one another. So far, most of what I'm seeing is Lutheran teachers who are beginning to talk to one another and share ideas with one another. The next phase, the next iteration of this, is for us to discover and to capitalize upon the ability to actually work collaboratively on lessons and resources. It's happening a little bit, but not that much. And I would argue that a flipped classroom model is a great way to do that. In fact, there's going to be an initiative. Uh, I mentioned Dr. Mary Hilgendorf, and she's going to be retiring soon. And um, uh, I don't know um, how soon, but uh, let's say she does it in the next year or two or three. And we uh, have already begun brainstorming about how she could do social studies uh, mini lectures and we could help write lessons that teachers could use in their classrooms across the country or world if they wanted to uh, have her help create some of the content. And teachers can do that mentoring and teaching and coaching in the classroom and customizing of it. So we have some neat possibilities for partnerships and uh, collaboration. Feel free to use the uh, hashtag in Twitter uh, for the conference, the, the 21 CLE, in an ongoing way, even after the conference ends, to try to connect with other people who are interested in collectively building content. Um, I'm going to stop. I will stick around for some comments and questions, but that's about the, con the end of my, my uh, presentation here. We are in conference room three right now, and the next presentation by Dr. Knorr who teaches our educational psychology, and he teaches, uh, I believe, uh, um, some methods uh, courses as well, or uh, methods of instruction. He's going to be talking about um, memory. And let me see, the exact title of his presentation is called A Model of Human Memory to Guide Teachers and Students. 
And if you'd like to participate in that, you're welcome to jump out of this room and in the other um, whenever you like.